Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching Today I Found Out, and in the video today, Forgotten History, the remarkable Walter Hunt and his world-changing inventions. Just before we get started, I do want to say that this episode is brought to you by iFixit. iFixit is a free online repair manual for everyone that is written by everyone. Before you start your next DIY repair, please head over to ifixit.com forward slash brain food and check out iFixit's high-quality parts, tools, and thousands of free repair guides. Walter Hunt is a man who is simultaneously considered to have possessed one of the finest inventive minds in all of American history, while also being an individual almost no one has heard of. This is despite the fact that it's almost guaranteed that one of his inventions, the safety pin, is probably lying somewhere in your home right now. This is something that he sold the patent for for a few hundred dollars, reportedly because he needed the money to pay off a $15 debt. This was a theme throughout his life, inventing various items that otherwise should have made him extremely wealthy and famous, but which never did because of his proclivity to sell his patents immediately and move on to his next great invention. Because we'd be here all day if we discussed at any level of detail everything Hunt patented during his lifetime, instead we'll give you a small smattering of examples so you can get an idea of just how prolific an inventor he was. Along with the safety pin and the first commercially viable lock-stitch sewing machine, Hunt invented and patented a more efficient oil lamp, an attachment to boats that allowed them to break through ice, various improvements on bullet and casing designs, a rope-making machine, a machine that made nails, an improved fountain pen, a portable knife sharpener, an innovative saw, a coal-heated convection oven, an early version of the repeating rifle, and, most incredibly of all, a device that allowed the user to walk on the ceiling, dubbed the anti Podian apparatus, which he sold to a circus. While some of these inventions are antiquated and seldom used today, others were pretty revolutionary, in particular the repeating rifle, which Hunt dubbed the volitional repeating rifle. He sold it to an American businessman, George Arrowsmith, who then sold it to the founders of Smith & Wesson, that's Benjamin Tyler Henry, Horace Smith, and Daniel B. Wesson. The design of Hunt's rifle was studied by and improved upon by the trio, eventually serving as the basis for the Henry repeating rifle, famed for its widespread use in the American Civil War. This latter rifle, in turn, was the basis for the more famous Winchester Repeater, arguably one of the most famous guns of all time. Hunt saw little recognition for his contributions to the weapon and never received any royalties or payments beyond the relatively paltry sum given to him for the original patent, which was basically the story of Hunt's life. Born in 1796 on a small farm in Lewis County, New York, Hunt's beginnings were humble and his education was surprisingly lacking for a man who'd later be renowned for his mechanical mind. Supposedly educated in a one-room schoolhouse, Hunt, the eldest of 13 children, left formal education in his early teens and settled into the life of a simple farmer. However, his curiosity for tinkering soon found him helping out at a nearby textile mill where many of his family members worked, and where he helped the owner, Willis Hoskins, and another worker, Zeba Knox, make improvements to a flax spinning machine that was used there. Despite helping the pair improve the machine, the young Hunt was left off the patent. However, soon after this, Hunt went and invented an even better flax spinning machine and patented that in 1826. Hunt then endeavored to manufacture and sell his machine to secure a better life for himself and his young family. We should note here that he married his childhood sweetheart in his teens, and eventually the pair had four children. Towards this end, Hunt traveled to New York and attempted to find investors to back production, but became increasingly frustrated when nobody would give him the time of day. It's presumed Hunt's small-town upbringing and lack of formal education made it difficult for him to assure banks and investors that he could be trusted with their money. Running short on funds, Hunt sold the patents for the machine, using the funds to relocate his family to New York, hoping to find his fortune there with his next invention. In 1827, Hunt filed for his second patent, this time for a foot-operated gong that was to be fitted to carriages. Hunt was said to have been inspired to create the device after witnessing a small girl hit by a horse carriage. This sort of thing was not uncommon because at the time people in carriages shared the road. To help get around the problem, many carriages had air horns installed. However, to sound the horn, it required the driver to have one hand free to operate it. This was occasionally a problem if both hands were needed to drive the horses. A foot pedal operated gong neatly solved the issue. Again, despite the appeal and necessity of his invention being immediately obvious, Hunt similarly had trouble securing an investor to fund manufacturing of the device, and so he sold the patent and moved on to his next invention. Why Hunt opted to nearly always choose to sell his patents outright rather than hold on to them or ask for royalties as a part of the sale agreement isn't fully clear, though given that he was not independently or otherwise wealthy, one assumes he simply always had a need for money to support his family, so was inclined 
inclined to take the quick money rather than lesser amounts up front, but better long-term prospects in royalties. And given how prolific an inventor he was, it may well be that he just always assumed he'd be able to come up with something new in order to keep the money coming in, which, to be fair, is exactly what happened throughout his entire life. Perhaps the best example of Hunt selling a world-changing patent occurred in 1849 when a draftsman called J.R. Chapin began pressuring Hunt to settle a $15 debt, which is about $422 today. Low on funds, Hunt did what he always did to settle debts. He sat down and invented something, the modern safety pin, reportedly after just three hours of playing around with a spool of wire. While Hunt's invention wasn't a totally new idea, with variations on clothing pins going all the way back to the 14th century BCE, it was a massive improvement on anything that came before it, thanks to the clasp at the end which kept anyone from getting poked, and the coiled wire design giving enough spring to keep the pin locked in place, even as the person wearing it moved around. Just as important to the design being extremely functional, the whole thing was also incredibly easy and cheap to manufacture. As a testament to the design's simplicity and functionality, unlike many products that have evolved over time, in the near two centuries since Hunt invented the safety pin, the basic design hasn't really changed at all. As he had done so often before Hunt sold the patent for the safety pin for a reported $400, which is $11,000 today, with the rights ultimately ending up in the hands of W. R. Grayson Company, who would go on to make many millions of dollars from the product. Perhaps Hunt's third most famous invention, outside of the safety pin and the repeating rifle, was that of the first commercially viable sewing machine that used a then-revolutionary two-threaded lockstitch mechanism. Legend has it that Hunt refused to patent his 1833 automated sewing machine invention because he didn't want to put seamstresses out of work, so he didn't push the invention with various companies as he didn't want to see it made. However, this commonly touted notion seems questionable, as while he didn't patent the idea, he did sell the rights to make the machine to the aforementioned George Arrowsmith. Arrowsmith then attempted to manufacture the sewing machine, but had difficulty raising the needed capital from investors, owing to something of an overabundance of seamstresses working on the cheap at the time. Thus, he gave up on the project, choosing, like Hunt before him, to not even bother patenting it. It would be over a decade before another person would come up with such a viable sewing machine, most notable to this story. Elias Howe Jr. Howe seemingly independently invented and patented his own lockstitch sewing machine that pretty much worked exactly like Hunt's. Soon after, various companies, most notably Singer Sewing Machines, started copying and selling Howe's design, at which point Howe began suing them. During the course of litigation, Hunt's previous invention was brought to light, with the companies then arguing that Howe's patent was invalid because Hunt had long before invented more or less the same machine which used the innovative lockstitch. And as Hunt hadn't patented his design, they felt they were free to copy it. It was at this point that Hunt got himself into the game and decided to see if he could retroactively get a patent or otherwise force said companies to pay him for use of his design. At the same time, he began work once again on the sewing machine, coming up with an improved design that solved the then common jamming problem via automatically feeding the cloth in at an even rate and then patenting that improvement. True to form, he swiftly sold the rights to that patent after receiving it. While the patent office did refuse to give Hunt a retroactive patent for the original design, they did acknowledge that he invented the device, but that Howe's patent was still valid owing to Howe having applied for a patent first. Nevertheless, in 1858, Singer Sewing Machines, which is still around today, settled with Hunt out of court, agreeing to pay him $50,000, which is about $1.4 million today, for their copying his original design and subsequently making a fortune from it. And so it was that the Hunt family finally made a small fortune off of one of his inventions, right? Well, sadly, no. He died of pneumonia shortly after the agreement was made and before the $50,000 settlement was due to be paid to him. His family, however, reportedly did benefit from the settlement. Funnily enough, Hunt's final resting place is in the same cemetery as Howe's, Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. Seemingly fitting, given how his life went, Hunt's grave marker, while more than a simple gravestone, as is often reported, is dwarfed by Howe's mini monument. In the end, while he never made a fortune off the various inventions that did make other people rich, nor was he well known in life or death like so many other prolific inventors, the New York Tribune did at least publish an article about Hunt after he passed away, noting, For more than 40 years he has been known as an experiment in the arts, whether in mechanical movements, chemistry, electricity, or metallic compositions. He was always at home, and probably in all, he has tried more experiments than any other inventor. So I really hope you're enjoying this video so far, and just before we get into the bonus facts, let me tell you a 
quick bit about iFixit. iFixit is a website which teaches people how to fix things. On this site, there are always brand new repair guides being posted and also loads of video teardowns of the most popular devices on the market, things like iPhones, the SA, Nintendo Switch, all sorts of things out there. In fact, there are 25,000 repair videos if you go to ifixit.com forward slash brain food, also a link in the description below. But also, you can up your repair game by buying the Pro Tech Toolkit. This is perfect for all sorts of electronics repairs, whether you're an expert or you're a beginner. In fact, in a, in a true and crazy coincidence, I was recently building a new computer, which is right over there, and a friend of mine comes around and he's got like this toolkit and he rolls the whole thing out, and I'm like, is that an iFixit toolkit? And it absolutely was, and he was raving about it. This is not me making some story up for the ad spot. This genuinely happened like two weeks ago, and I was, I was, it was perfect for this spot because I knew he had one coming up and I thought I would mention that. All the parts are super high quality and it's perfect for almost any repair. It's also super easy to store, you just roll it up. Also, it's only $59.99 and it contains a screwdriver with 64 bits. Plus, all of those squeezes and picks and you know all those different devices that you need to take apart a device that the manufacturer doesn't want you to take apart and repair. All of that, plus it has a lifetime warranty. So all you need to do to get your hands on that for just $59.99 is go to ifixit.com forward slash brain food. You'll find a link in the description below. And thanks to iFixit for sponsoring. All right, now let's get into those bonus facts. In 1830, a French tailor by the name of Barthélemy Thimonnier patented a sewing machine that used the chain stitch, the first such machine to replicate sewing by hand. By 1841, he had a factory with over 80 machines and a contract with the French army for uniforms. However, the factory was destroyed by a riotous group of French tailors who were afraid the sewing machine would spell the end of their trade. Thimonnier never recovered and died pretty much penniless. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, hit that thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe. Check out iFixit, there's a link in the description below. And thank you for watching.